Go where your best prayers take you, unclench the fists of your spirit and take it easy. Breathe deeply of the glad air and live one day at a time. Know that you're precious and learn to trust. Amen. Well, there is a challenge out that Chris preached next week from up there. <laughs> they know I am too old to climb that. Someone said, you know, that, you know, we do that thing is put Chris up there until you give all the money. We don't get him down or something. I don't know. Um, do you know why that's there? You probably don't. We had a lightning strike, hit the building, and knocked stone loose. Literally blew a corner off our, up there. And we did not know it. And then it rained in, and then it got wet. Now we are dry and all plastered in the stones back. So a little pointing around the top to make sure other damage from that stone you sit on the front side. So we're always a work in progress, these old buildings. It's in good shape. Do you know where you were on uh, September the 24th this year? It's a Monday. Well, Mike Pereira knows where he was. He lives in Bishop, South, uh, Bishop, California, and he was driving up to the mountains, the high eastern Sierra Mountains, up to 10,000 feet to go fly fishing with some friends of his. And as they were driving, they were listening to the radio because they're all football fans, NFL football fans, and they were listening to the Green Bay Packers and Seattle Seahawks ball game. And the game was almost over when they pulled into where they were going to leave their car, grab their gear and hit the trail and get out and fish. And, a minute left of the game or something. They didn't think anything about it. Jumped out of the car and just took off. Had a great time fishing. In a couple of days, Mike drove back down to the nearest little town to get some supplies. Um, and so they could stay and finish their um, fly fishing experience. And uh, this may have happened to you. He's driving down the mountain, driving down, driving down. And all of a sudden, his phone came back into cell service. You know, you don't have it and then you do have it. And his phone went berserk. Went I mean, exploded on the dashboard, started buzzing, flashing, ringing, everything that it could do, so hard that it fell into the floorboard. Well, he pulled over, picked it up. First, it was a few emails, texts, and then it was hundreds, and then it was thousands. And he looked down. He only had to read one to know why. Now, let me take you back to the ball game he didn't finish. That game ended with replacement officials. Some of you may know that. And they made a terrible call at the end, and the wrong team won the game for the, in the last play. It was just terribly messed up. And some of you, do some of you who, who know who Mike Pereira is? He is, was the vice president of officiating for NFL football and is the leading expert on the rules of the game in America today. Has a, some of, uh, the guys know, the women, I know you're not listening to him. The guys know he's on every talk show, every radio show on the sports. He works for Fox News. He's on CNN. He's on everything. He's the man. And guess what? When the man is needed, what's he doing? Fishing. If he's good, he's keeping his elbow in. He's fly fishing. He is after it in the mountains with his buddies. And he thought, what do I do? So he called his bosses at Fox News, knowing they were probably looking for him. Everybody was looking for Mike. And he said, you know, he said, I've missed this thing. And he said, I know, I'm sorry. He said, I just wasn't near the internet, the telephone. He said, I was fishing. I told you I was going fly fishing. He said, I really need this time. He said, it's really important to me, deeply important. And you won't believe what they said at Fox. You know what? We missed it. A couple of days have gone by. We'll catch you. Go back, finish the fishing, catch us on the other side. Which they did. And if you pull his name up, you will see the million times that he has made commentary since then. He was immediately on the television, on every radio talk show. He was on, in the papers. He's big time. But you know what? He didn't say a word about fishing or being gone. But his wife did. She was asked, what do you think about it that he was fishing and missed this, I mean, it's the biggest thing that's ever happened in his world. He said, well, she said, well, Mike is great at balancing his life, which is the most important thing. Mike is great at balancing his life, which is the most important thing. There are crunch times 
when we have to be on the job. And if you're not there, you'll probably get fired. <laughs> and I will too. It's not a joke, is it? And if you're not on the job, what about with your children or other responsibilities? We have to be there. We have to show up. We have to take care of business. But Mike's story is more than just an illustration about taking some good time off from work. He's pointing to something deeper, really. And I caught it that it was deeper because this article, this story, appeared in the sports section of a major national newspaper. And I read the story and I kept thinking sports. Read the story and kept thinking sports. And then I got it. You see, this is about really deeply attending to one's life. Mike's not just talking about take some time off. He's talking about learning to balance one's life in a sensible, sane way in an insane, insatiable society. I'm not going to say that twice. The number one thing you talk about in my presence, in Chris's presence, in Tom Rasnick's presence, and Bo Lewis's presence, is how busy you are and how many demands you have. Period. Hear it every day. And I sit in my culture all around me. And I say it to you how many times? I know you're sick of me saying it. I say it all the time. I want you to hear what you say, what we are all saying. So when I saw that story, I knew this was important. It was a parable. Mike Pereira, not himself personally, but this event, this story is a parable of our time, and it's an important one. If you don't hear me say anything else or ask anything of you today, I hope you'll stay with me, but if you don't, that's okay. Hear this. Is your life in balance? Is your life in balance? And would you know if it is not? And if it is not, what can you do to get it a little moving back towards some balance? We all remember 9-11 way too well. One of the interesting things that came from 9-11 was a major study conducted with all the people who came to give help. The doctors, the nurses, the paramedics, the firemen, firewomen, the police people, the mental health experts, the so social workers, people turned out in droves, dug in, dug their heels in, got dirty, and stayed with it endlessly for days and weeks. While that site, now that's open and rebeautified and almost rebuilt, was just a pit. And we all remember the smoldering images of that time. And what, when they studied these people, what they came to is a pretty simple conclusion, but very powerful. What they were looking at is what happens to people when they're under this kind of stress and what happens to them. Bad stuff. Bad stuff happens to us when we're under stress. And there was one, only one antidote. Only one antidote to it. It was to take time off that was really recuperative in comparison to the time on. To take time off and away from the stuff that is stressing you, ripping, pulling, tearing at you. Because you're going to have that stuff. If you don't now, it's going to come. And it's going to come at whatever age you are. We still have it. We have it throughout life. It doesn't end. And if you're in one of those places, I'm not throwing a toss off, I'm trying to get there with you. So don't let this smolder you more because you may be in a tough place right now. I, I've been there. People around us often don't know we're there when we're there. But if you're in one of those places, stress will do us in. So you have to maximize then what you can do to help yourself by balancing those times of stress. And if you looked across your life, if you really looked across your life today and take that thought of balancing, what would you see? But don't leave out any area. Every area counts. You may feel like it's one place, but what about all the places of your life? Is your life balanced? 
See, balancing life is about everything. Diet, exercise, time to just to rest, sleep more when we haven't had enough sleep, time to be alone when we've been with too many people or, too, or people too much. You, you catch that? It's about all that stuff, and you can just keep building the list. Whatever's on your list, don't leave anything off. That's why you may not be aware of the mega churches. They're talking all about this. Did you know that? The big movement today, the guy that wrote The Purpose Driven Life, you know what he's talking about now? Died in exercise. In church on Sundays, every Sunday. It's because it matters. It matters. And how we go is often how the people around us go. And how much we can respond. And how productive our lives are. There's no doubt. But there's a deeply important spiritual principle at work. You see, because when you attend to yourself in this way, you're attending to the fact that you are a soul. You don't have a soul. You are a soul. Put that silly talk away. You don't have a soul like your pieces and parts. You are a whole person, every one of you. And you have a soul that is all of you, if you have one. You are a soul. It is every bit of all your life. That's part of our society in its busyness. We chop and splinter and cut ourselves into pieces. You're not in pieces. We feel in pieces. And the stress will even accentuate that as well. And your soul takes some time, takes some energy and attention. It deserves your best for you. You, the soul, deserve your best for you. All the attention you can give it. And you know, you can balance it in a million ways. That's maybe what they're going to do at the mega church. I'm not going to do that. We get a signboard up, <laughs> I'd give you ways you can do that. You can do it, and we can help each other with that. Find people around you who look like they're balanced. Find a place that you're having a struggle and get somebody to help you. It can be done. You see, there is that spiritual principle at play. You've heard the evangelicals say it put God first. How many of you have heard it? Come on, you, everybody's heard it. Don't just sit there look. Everybody's heard this. And I've often thought, how do I put God first? What's that mean? Before my family? Before my work? Before responsibilities? It just, it never made sense. It makes sense, though. What they're saying is dead on. I just say it in a different way. I think Many people might say it in a different way and say the same thing. Putting God first is putting God at the center so that there's balance. Putting God at the center. The center helps us find what is the balance. Where we're tilted too far one place or the other place. That's how God becomes first. It's not picking God over other things, faith over other things. It's letting God be part of everything. It is making sure that God and God's love and God's will is in every part of my life. That's why you come here, I think, I hope. It's not going to work very well if you don't. The parts you leave out and God's not touching, that's where you're going to have ailments. That's where I have ailments. That's where our society has ailments. We know that. That's part of our heritage. That's how it works. I mean, what part would you leave out? Would you really leave out parenting? God's not part of my parenting? Or let's say business ethics. Let's see. I think this week God won't be part of my business ethics. Uh, I wonder how much loose cash will be in the offering today. <laughs> you know? I mean, you get it? God must be part of all of it. That's how it works. You see, the story from Genesis about Jacob is incredibly important. Because it's not a how-to, it's really a life wisdom lesson. It's 4,500 years old. 4,500 years old. <clears throat> and what Jacob is reflecting is as he's learned to balance his life in these encounters with God, when he finds God at the center of his life, and in this story, God's at the center of a dream. When he finds God at the center of his life, his life becomes thankful and full of gratitude. It becomes thankful and full of gratitude. Reread the passage. Take it home. He says, everything I've been given, God's given me. He has a radical, different look at the world today. 
like we can have when we live here. God has given me all this stuff. I can learn to be thankful and gracious with it. What a shift. And see, when it's practiced that way, when life is practiced that way, we all know it's different. And the end of this lesson is important. A way to balance our lives is to put a pencil point on it. He says, I'm going to tithe. And it became the walk of Judeo-Christians since then. This was their story and our heritage. We really do do this. I know you think it's a once-a-year conversation. It's an everyday conversation. We practice tithing as a way to balance life and get God at the center. And what would you leave out? Your energy, your talents, your creativity, your time, your money. Which part do you want to leave out of that conversation? Because that's the part you're leaving out. The part you leave out is the part you want to leave out. Just like it all, balancing is getting it all in there and figuring it out. And that's all we can do with each other. Help each other, walk along, and figure it out. But we have a place to start. You don't have to give 80% of your time in order to balance your life. You don't give 80% of your energy to balance your life. You don't give away 80% of your money in order to balance your life. You learn to give a tithe away. And 10% of anything in this culture is a ton. I want you to think about if you would give me 10% of your time today. How many hours would that be? 2.4. So all of you get to stay after church with me for two and a half hours. <laughs> so Jerry Eskew and I can't go to the golf course. Some of you can't go to lunch. You get my point? It's a big deal. I think why don't we just pass this over? It's a big deal. You know, I, it brought back, me thinking about this brought back memories from my childhood. I was thinking about sitting in church with my dad at early church. I probably was the only child in early church at the time, in our little Episcopal church. I was probably kicking and making noise or something. But they were passing the plate, and when it went by, my father put a $10 bill in. And my head was on a swivel. Because I'm telling you, yeah, I'm going to tell you how old I am. Fifty-something years ago, $10 was a lot of money to give to the church. Six, seven hundred dollars a year. Maybe more, I have no idea. On those salaries at that time, and I thought, you know what I thought, I'll tell you what I thought. I don't know what I think I thought, but I remember thinking this, then I thought, you know, that's about a hundred ice creams from that little ice cream truck that goes around. I am not joking, they, there was this little thing called the carousel, and it was round, and he from Memphis, and we'd drive the streets and you could buy ice cream. I was thinking, those are 10 cents and I can have a hundred of those. Whoa, that died, that, where'd that go? I also thought that's about 40 kites because I was a major league kite flyer. They were 25 cents for a paper kite. I had 5,000 feet of string and a 30-foot tail from my father's shirt. See, I really did do that. I was a kite geek, and I could fly kites all day. But see, I put it in my perspective. I thought, Dad, gum, that's a lot. And now I know what my father, doing that simple act, was allowing me to have. It's a set of training wheels. The tithe is a set of training wheels about money. That then can be a way about other stuff. You could do it with time or passion or energy. A little harder to measure. I know I could measure money. My father was doing that. He was measuring it this way. See, he was giving me a set of training wheels to keep me balanced, to show me how to give money to the church. Clearly, no doubt. But he's also showing me how to start giving it a level that made some impact, not only on the people you're giving it to, but to yourself that it shifts your thinking, it gets your attention. What is my life really about? Who am I really wanting to be? That's what the question really is. It's not about funding budgets for Second Harvest or St. John's Cathedral or the Episcopal School of Knoxville or any non-tax uh, non charitable organization you give to. That's not what it's about. It's about you and me asking who do we want to be. That's what this whole deal is about. Who do I want to be when I grow up? That's what my father was allowing me to have, a set of training wheels so that that would keep me balanced, riding that bike with those training wheels so eventually that that balance would go from the external training wheels to inside of me. And that, that balance would be part of my journey, that I didn't have to rely on anything. See, it was internal. 
Because it wasn't about giving the 10%. It was about learning to be thankful and gracious. And do you know what? Like some of you, I forgot the lesson for a lot of years. And I had to relearn it. And be honest with you, I think I'm still on that journey of learning that lesson. That's the kind of adult I want to be when I grow up. And I forsake it periodically. <coughs> Don't know about you, but it makes me sad for me. So tithing is like a set of training wheels, helping us find balance that becomes internal, where Jesus says, where rust doesn't accumulate, nothing can steal it. Nothing can take it away. Regardless of what happens to you, you have that balance. You know, I saw this the other day with a young couple who got married almost a year ago. I always kid the young couples when they come through. Some of y'all, I kid y'all. Are y'all still married? And they kind of, <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're still married. And then we talked a little bit. I said, how are things going? Oh, and I said, What's, what are the hard things? Tell me a little bit. One's in school. One's having a hard time finding full-time work. They're really struggling. And then they both lit up and said, but there's really something cool. I said, what's that? Do you know we took on an African child? I said, what? They don't have any money. I said, what do you mean? He said, we're giving money every week. We put a little money together and we send a check and we're supporting a child in Africa. By the way, they're doing it through a credible place. Don't use places that are not authentic. A really great place, got a great track record. And they get real reports about this young boy that they're taking care of. Helping go to school, helping pay his medical school, uh, medical bills as well. I've never seen anybody light up like those young people. Talking about that piece of giving something tangible away. And I knew right there, they're going to be okay. You see, after all, this balanced life is to let God in to be part of all parts. It is to let God into your life. No exclusions. No games. No trade-offs. No way out. To let God be part of every part. And I promise you, when that happens, terrific things happen. Amen. Amen.